live and uncensored. 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 There are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the U.S., and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz and swing, result from marijuana usage. This marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and any others. So said Harry Anslinger, head of the U.S. Federal Bureau of Narcotics, an organization which would later become the DEA. This was part of his effort to criminalize marijuana, which he did in 1937. Most of the Western world was swift to follow. Now, medicinal marijuana is legally available in 23 U- U.S. states, recreational marijuana in three, yet it's still illegal at the federal level, classified as a Schedule One narcotic, alongside heroin, LSD, and ecstasy. This means no current accepted medical use. Colorado State is estimated to receive $125 million in marijuana tax revenue alone, enough for it to offer its citizens a tax rebate and to build some schools. Meanwhile, over here in Europe, marijuana has been decriminalized in Holland and Portugal, while the UK just keeps muddling along, classifying cannabis as a Class B drug on par with amphetamines and codeine, and seemingly has no interest in either the medicinal or the social possibilities, not to mention the dangers of butane hash oil and other highly concentrated forms. But wake up, UK. Just like Starbucks, nuclear submarines, childhood obesity, and sagging genes, America is sending another trend your way. Only this one, um, is anyone going to eat those brownies? Intelligent listening for dangerous minds. This is Latopia. Latopia after dark. After dark. After dark. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Latopia After Dark. I'm Ian Wynn, the techno pagan octopus messiah, over here with super producer agent Mr. Peter Cox, who's also our head baker tonight. Uh, we're near Baker Street. That's why that's funny. Uh, if you love us, and we know you do, how about you give us a buck a show? Just go to the website, latopia.com, and follow the links. Now, generally, when people talk about decriminalizing marijuana, they do so with a clear confirmation bias. Those who think marijuana is a good thing will cherry pick their data, though, no, I'm pretty sure it won't cure cancer, though we'll ask tonight. Those who think marijuana is a bad thing will quote studies showing it to be a gateway drug damaging to developing minds or worse. Anne Slinger also said, reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. Well, we all know that's true. Tonight, we're going to talk about marijuana from an objective clinical perspective. Tonight, we've invited the head of the Independent Global Drug Survey, one of the largest independent sources of drug use data trends in the world, addiction specialist Dr. Adam Winstock, MBBS, BSC, MSC, MRCP, MRC, Psych, FACH, AM, Clinical Senior Lecturer and Honorary Consultant Psychiatrist at King's College London. He's going to help us make sense of marijuana's lofty highs, gentle buzzes, and like, total bummers, as well as to talk drug use and drug policy in general. Dr. Winstock, welcome to the show. Uh, yeah, that used to be my job. I kind of slightly changed and Adam's just fine. Adam is just fine. Can I call you Doc? Uh, if it makes you feel happy, that's fine. So Adam, opening salvo here, what's your tipple? Uh, it used to be single malt. Now it's kind of Guinness uh, and espresso. Straight up Guinness. Are you? Will you drink it from a can? No, although I, I admit to having drunk uh, Guinness from one of those funky cans that you put on one of those little um, hot plates and then you pour it into a glass and it goes psh. It looks quite cool, but it tastes bad. Are you taking any supplements? Any any vitamin supplements? I like to ask our No, I have friend. a generally balanced diet, so... Generally balanced diet? If I ate vitamins, I just pee them out. So you, you work with patients in the NHS. You're an addiction specialist. Yep. Uh, what are people addicted to the most these days that you see? So in terms of people seeking treatment? Yeah, people come in seeking treatment. Uh, it's alcohol, heroin, crack cocaine, with lesser numbers, benzodiazepines, cannabis. And, and then I run a, a little chemsex clinic. So I see a group of people who... Chem, chemsex clinic? Uh, so people who use drugs to facilitate sex. So it's predominantly gay men, but around things like crystal meth, G, methadrone. And, and those people seek treatment, not so much because they're addicted, but the whole combination the whole of, of, of sex drugs has led to a b- whole bunch of other kind of risk behaviors that's maybe led to them developing HIV or problems at work, problems with relationships. 
And I only mention that because I think everyone thinks the only reason you seek help for drugs is you're dependent. That's actually just not true for everyone. You can have a drug problem and not necessarily be dependent on a drug. It's interesting you say that because something that I've wondered uh, living over here is how has the UK by and large escaped the crystal meth epidemic that's sweeping through the United States? It's interesting. So they've talked about a meth epidemic coming to the UK for the last 15 or 20 years. And it hasn't happened. I think there's probably three major reasons. So one is um, the UK's been fairly content with really poor quality, crappy amphetamine sulfate powder for the last 25 years. Average purity of amphetamine in the UK is about 4 or 5%. It's, it's really rubbish. The UK is also fairly content. Whereas Walter White in Breaking Bad was getting up to what, in the 90s? Well, we'd be making crystal meth. So crystal meth versus amphetamine, slightly different drug, more potent, longer acting. Um, so I think that probably the UK just wouldn't know what to do with it. But I think more importantly, the dealing networks that were really established here were to do with coke and crack cocaine. And actually, I think in terms of making money, I think crack cocaine is a far better way of making money. So I think there's probably cartels, gangs, criminals going, actually, Crystal's probably not where our best bang for buck is, probably didn't come in wasn't really coming in much from Europe. But you can make it here. Absolutely. But if you talk to crack cocaine users who have used Crystal, what they'll say is they don't like it because it's too intense and it's too difficult to control. So crack cocaine gets you, you know, off your face for like two to five minutes. You come down, you know, I mean, it can bankrupt you in a weekend. Crystal, you know, for some people will last four, eight, 12 hours. Right. It's just not that controllable. So... The UK but it's, stimulant. It's still, I mean, I under, I kind of understand where you're coming from, but it's also like it's through Southeast Asia and it's in Japan. Because it's, it's massive in the States. Because that's where most of it is manifest. So Southeast Asia is where most of the world's you know, amphetamine type sul- uh, stimulants get manufactured and distributed. So it dominates the market, you know, cheap to make, easy to distribute. And the States, I think it worked well for, you know, Certain groups of the population where coke was too expensive, yeah. really good dealing networks, Mexican bank gangs, and, and a really big country, which means you can make crystal without attracting too much attention, like in Australia. So Australia, oh, right. they have a big you know, but they don't have a coke problem because coke in Australia is 250 euros a gram because it's a small population. Getting coke into Australia is really difficult. Getting an apple into Australia is really difficult. So stimulant yeah, and choice. Johnny Depp and his dog. Well, that's it. You, it's just difficult to get anything, anything into Australia. Which makes which makes some sense. So you've worked in A&Es, uh, which is accident and emergencies for our state uh, listeners. Yeah, I've, I've worked in emergency departments and psychiatric hospitals and outpatient clinics. And when people come in with uh, symptoms of, uh, with like an overdose or having drug problems, what is what are they generally coming in for? So it depends what drug. So yeah. um, heroin, people come in, they ain't breathing and they're blue and they're going to die. So unconscious, unrousable. Pulp Fiction, got to jab them with, uh, with adrenaline in the heart. Oh, it's such a bad <laughs> missed opportunity. <laughs> no, they really um, could have done better. Yeah, naloxone stuck in your thigh, life-saving. Big needles in the heart, no. Um, yeah, bad news. People who come in with alcohol and benzo overdoses, unconscious, unrousable. Um, and then you've got people who come in with too much of an amphetamine-type drug, crystal, coke, come in agitated, aggressive, you know, hallucinating, uh, and cause chaos in, in in the environment. You know, place staff at risk, often get brought in by the police. Yeah. Um, I've been there once, and I really hope never to go back. Uh, that was, a, personally, that was, a, I had a reaction to mefloquine. Uh, which is an anti-malarial, which was, they're talking about banning it in, um, talking about banning it for the UK armed forces. And that one sent me off the rails. The UK armed forces have said, actually, Larium's fine. Have they really? Yeah, they're looking into the evidence again, but at the moment they're going, it's fine, it's better than getting malaria and it's okay. It has saved a lot of people from malaria. And uh, not that I'm bitter or anything, but I lost a year of my life. Uh, have you ever seen anyone come in for cannabis? People to with, an A&E. So people with severe mental health problems like schizophrenia or bipolar affective disorder who have used cannabis and that's the thing that has triggered a lapse? Absolutely. Um, 
I'll tell you what, though, it's, it's weird. So one of the things we look at the Global Drug Survey every year is what percentage of people who have used a drug over the last year have turned up to an accident and emergency. So for alcohol around the world, this is like, you know, 80,000 drinkers, it was just over 1%. The cannabis users, and we had 70,000 cannabis users last year, just under 1% of cannabis users said they had sought emergency medical treatment in the last year. Really? Yeah. So there's, there's a downward trend. What, what do you think that, what do you attribute that to? Well, I mean, listen, it was people turning up, mostly having smoke, smoked high-potency cannabis, turning up agitated, panicky, and paranoid. You know, they go there four hours later, it's fine. Did they stay mad? Did they develop schizophrenia? No, of course, the majority of them didn't. But the idea that it's completely benign, even in the short term, actually isn't true. And I wouldn't have guessed that. You know, that 1% figure was way higher than I would have thought. So clinically speaking, if someone, quote unquote, takes too much and freaks out, is that a short term psychosis in your opinion? No, it's actually really difficult to hallucinate if you just smoke cannabis. You know, I mean, maybe if you kind of swallow half an ounce of, you know, high potency in a cookie or something. Well, the point is that it's not lethal. You can't, you can't no, die from cannabis. No, it would be, you know, I think the way you would die from a cannabis overdose would be someone would, would shove a pound of cannabis down your throat and you'd mm. suffocate, you know. Or, um, you'd, or you'd have a ton dumped on you on the Mexican border. Something and like that. Suffocate. Or, or you drive stoned. Which is uh, And... You know, again, there's lots of people who drive stoned and they'll they'll think they're fine. Predominantly, because most people who drive stoned go, I know I'm stoned, so I'm going to drive a bit more slowly and a bit more carefully. And if you talk to police, police know who's driving stoned. Because in the UK, <laughs> they're driving at 29 miles an hour, right. dead straight. And so people can compensate a little bit because they're driving more slowly and they don't do overtaking. But when you're stoned, your reaction time is impaired. So uh, actually you know, lots of cannabis users will say sensible thing, don't drive stoned. I think that there's a lot, that's sort of one of the surprising um, sort of common common knowledge things. People tend to think, oh, you drive much better when you're high because you go slower. But now that the research is in, I'm surprised by the fact that there's a, been a, actually a lot of road fatalities in, in, uh, in Colorado. Some of that has to do with, uh, you know, they're mixing alcohol, people are mixing alcohol and marijuana. And when they write up the, the report, they say, oh, well, that one spiked for, for marijuana. So we don't really have clear figures on that. But you're right. It, it's the t a tiny bit of alcohol and a tiny bit of cannabis together can impair your driving way worse than just a pint or a split. That combination's really bad, particularly if you're 18 and you've only been driving for six months. Okay, but let me ask you this. Worse or the same as, you know, texting while you drive? Oh, my guess is if you're stoned and you've had a pint, you'll probably be texting as well. Oh, right. You okay. want to share a thought. The trifecta. Yeah. Exactly. Hello, producer Pete here, just insinuating myself for the merest moment to say thank you so much to everyone who's helping us keep Latopia After Dark on the air. We really couldn't do it without your support. And if you're not a patron yet, please do consider becoming one for just a dollar a show. That's all. Only a dollar a show is what we ask. You can keep the net's longest running and best literary and current affairs podcast on the air. Our aim is to go weekly, but we can only do that with your kind support. So if you like us, if you think we're doing something original, something that you can't get from traditional broadcast media, then please do show your support by giving us a dollar a show. Go to latopia.tv slash LAD and click on the Become a Patron link now. Thank you so much. If people want to check out a, another fascinating program, uh, go to El Narco on the Latopia After Dark page, we had a journalist by the name of Ion Grio, who uh, works along the Mexican border with 75,000 fatalities just in the last year. Uh, craziness. Um, he became interested in the whole drug, in covering the drug war, because he grew up in Brighton and saw a lot of people go down for, uh, you know, from heroin addiction and overdose and this kind of thing. And he wanted to follow, sort of follow that tale back to the head of the dragon. And he's actually still down there. Good luck to you, Ion. Hope you're still alive. What got you interested in field of addiction medicine? Probably two things. So one is I grew up in London in kind of, you know, the mid-80s. And at that time, kind of ecstasy scene had just started. <laughs> Plumbing had just started. <laughs> and I had a whole bunch of friends who were all DJs who all came back from Ibiza in about 1984, 1985. I just started medical school. And they went, ah, you know, we've just taken this drug. Like, what do you know about it? And I went... 
I don't know. And they said, go, go find out. So I like became... So you went and got a medical degree. Hey, I just thought, <laughs> hey, I'll try and be useful to my friends. So I, you know... That's a and, solid, bro. So I, I suddenly <laughs> found myself surrounded, you know, in warehouse parties going, wow, these people look really happy. I think I need to go and find a little bit at what's going on. Mm. So it started through clubbing and then I went, I went to Yale for four months and I did some work with HIV positive uh, heroin users. And I saw these treatments that were basically helping people stop using heroin. And when the person who had a heroin problem stopped using heroin, their life got better and so did the lives of their wives and their kids. And it was just like, wow, here is a here is something that is a disease at some level, but if you stop this behaviour, your life gets better and your family gets better. This is, this is kind of interesting. Um, so, yeah. It's sort of like, things. you know, we talk about... Uh we talk about collateral damage. One person dies. That's a ripple effect across the whole family, especially if it's a young man who everybody has invested their time and resources into. And now he's, you know, lying on the couch and his whole life is. Uh, Absolutely. And, and clearly their lives didn't necessarily have to be like that, excepting that many people who end up with serious drug problems have dreadful, terrible lives. And that's about society being better and more equal, all the things that clearly our politicians ain't interested in because I ain't going to get them reelected. So you're saying you're doing this for the for the for the greater good? That was part of your your reasoning to choose this uh, career path. Surely it was it was getting in with the hot nurses and that fat NHS paycheck. I'm 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 way more cynical than I was originally. I, I was definitely a bit of an idealist. You know, my dad was a doctor, my brother was a doctor. To be honest, I'm sure at any point growing up, if I'd said to my dad, oh, you know, I think I might want to do advertising because I think act advertising and being a psychiatrist is actually quite similar. You're basically selling behavioral change, one for profit. And pharmaceuticals. And, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. Come on, the placebo effect. If you've got a good bedside manner and you can get the, and, and you think Zoloft will work, you, part, of your, part of your job is, or part of your purview is to, is to present a, a compelling case. Yeah, yeah but you know, I, I, I'll, I'll say to my patient, look, this may, this might work for you. I don't know. But if it does, that's good. And if it gives you side effects, come back, talk to me. I mean, mm. antidepressants don't make life better. They Personally, may be. I prefer the hard sell. You know, I want to believe, make me believe. Uh, I, oh, God, you're I, so ethical. This is, let's just move on here. Um, you, <laughs> tell me about the Global Drug Survey. It grew out of something I started in 1999, which was the Mixed Mag Drug Survey. It was a big clubbing survey we did every year. And I did that for about five years. And we would... What, passing out flyers at raves? What do we talk? Actually, initially, Mix Mag, which is a big clubbing magazine, would put the survey in their magazine and people would cut it out, fill it in, stick it in the post, and then myself and friends would spend hours plugging in the data. And um, So you were getting data from anyone who subscribed to Mix Mag was yeah, definitely... Yeah, and, you know, we used to get kind of two or 3,000 people rolling. who would do that, and they would share interesting data, and, and that was all fun. And we did that for about five years, uh, and then we took a break, and I came back to the UK in 2009, and it was just the time legal highs were just taking off, and I went, ooh, let's go and do this again. And so basically, year on year, more and more countries have joined, more and more media partners have joined. How many people have filled out the survey this year? Uh, so last year's survey, last we year's. had over 100,000 people. We were translated into 10 languages, media partners in 18 countries. And I think people take part because we ask stuff that's useful and relevant if you like taking drugs. When so you're asking, you're specifically targeting people who have taken or ex and or experienced drug use in the last year? No, uh, well, so 80% of our respondents have ever used an illegal drug. 20% haven't. 20% maybe have used drunk alcohol, used prescription drugs. About 65% have used an illicit drug in the last year. We're interested in all drugs, legal or not. Okay, so you're, you're doing alcohol, you're doing tobacco? Yep. Prescription Cap medication. Prescription medication. Smart drugs. Um, smart steroids, drugs. Steroids. Um, if Every, you, anything that's classified as a, as a narcotic. What drives me crazy is it's, drugs are just such a, it's such a clumsy word that we've used to describe, you know, we're made of drugs. We're carbohydrates and all. I mean, anything can be classified as, anything organic can be classified as, as a type of, as some kind of drug. So we're talking, you're specifically looking for... So the posh word would be, yeah, so, so psychoactive drugs, although 
a definition of what makes a drug psychoactive. You ask the government in the UK at the moment who are trying to put through some crazy bill called the Novel Psychoactive Drug Bill to ban all new drugs. You ask them to define what they mean by a psychoactive drug. They can't. So would, so and they def- probably won't. So if the government can't define it, it's obviously your job. What is psychoactive? To me, it means it affects some part of your brain in a noticeable, appreciable amount. Yeah, so you'd like notice some alteration in mood, cognition, or perception. But actually, really good food does that. Exercise does that. Well, food you know, is just different kinds of drugs. Absolutely. So then you start like, is nutmeg? Nutmeg, you know, that's a nice little kind of thing to put on your, um, you know, hot chocolate. But you have enough nutmeg, you can hallucinate your tit. And if you have too much... You can hallucinate your tits off in here, sir. Absolutely. Um, If you have too much nutmeg, you'll die. That's it. So strictly speaking, I think a psychoactive drug would be a drug that exerts its influence by altering, altering the balance of brain chemicals. But you need to be able to maybe prove that in a lab. I mean, most of the drugs we think of, nicotine, tobacco, caffeine, ecstasy, all of them alter the balance of things like dopamine. They act on brain receptors. And people enjoy the effect. I think that's probably also quite important. Yeah, people don't take recreational drugs to make them feel shitty. No, smart people take drugs because they're nice and they have a pleasurable experience. Unfortunately, not everyone knows how to take drugs in the best way to have fun. And some people take drugs in a ridiculous way, so they end up not having fun. So you're basically, you're trying to gather as much data as possible so you can reduce harm? Yeah, and increasingly, I think, accepting that maybe part of that's also increasing pleasure. Because actually, the avoidance of harm isn't the thing that drives drug use, it's actually... That must get you into a lot of trouble. Associating drugs with pleasure. Because they're totally demonized. Any kind of recreational drug that's not, you know, Ill, that's not legal in, a, in any particular nation is immediately demonized. If I talk about marijuana in the UK, it's, there's immediately people form, form opinions and... But it's demonized by people who have a thriving ideology underpinned by absolutely nothing other than something they probably learned growing up in primary school or that their parents believed or that their faith tells them. It's a nonsense. But the thing is, is you can't, you can't say it. You can't. No, but people in, people in respectable, quote unquote, respectable um, uh, professions, even journalists, they won't cop to, uh, to their previous drug use. I'm not going to. Respectable professions and journalists is quite an interesting sentence. That's what I said. Respectable professions. And and there are some journalists out there who I work with closely. And journalists. I I was very careful to separate them. Um, but like someone like yourself, I'm not going to even ask because I feel like, you know, there's no answer that you can give that'll make anyone feel better about you as a physician or as someone who's administering the, the biggest survey, drug survey. on. I, I, I either know too much or I know too little. There's no way that you can answer that, that question and get respect. Yeah, so, 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 and, and I, I just, and I'm not actually massively pro legalization or not. My interest really is I don't want people to use drugs in a way where they have to come and see someone like me. Basically, I think going to see a cancer doctor, that's really bad. Actually, having to go and see a drug and alcohol psychiatrist, that means life's gone wrong. And I'd much rather not have business. Right. Well, that's, uh, wow, there's, uh, there's some police that, uh, are definitely not feeling you on that. They'd love more business. In fact, they're against the, uh, the legalization, decriminalization of marijuana in the states. It's one of the big um, opponents of, um, of decriminalization. The police unions, the prison guard unions, private prisons. We'll get to that. Okay, you said in The Guardian, I'm going to quote you back to yourself here, Doc, sorry, Adam, uh, people with evidence resistance often have an ideological bug. Unfortunately, evidence resistance is a virulent and surprisingly potent strain of embedded ignorance. Love that. That's a really coherent sentence. I like that too. <laughs> oh, oh, you wrote that, sir. That's you. Oh, it might be my colleague, Mike Shiner. I may oh, have written, come I may on. Have Don't written go that to the ghostwriter. Just oh, you know. own it. Own it. That's a good sentence. Yeah, I totally support it as well. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Oh, mostly London. London. Australia oh, a bit, you know. A little Australia bit of for about Australia. nine years. Oh, God, you know, you, you can't take a compliment in this city. It's just unbelievable. Look at that. <laughs> I throw him a beautiful sentence. He goes right to the ghostwriter. Pete, what is wrong with this town? Okay, let's get to the evidence. Let's see. In California, um, marijuana is legally prescribed for everything from joint pain to sleep problems to, Doc, I've really got a lot of stress. Um, Based on the research, what are the clinical applications? Basically, 
what would if you were allowed to what would you prescribe marijuana for okay so uh, the elephant in the room is that not all marijuana is created equal so tons of different phenotypes yeah but you know how much thc how much cbd what's the condition so like 47 like, different psychoactive substances uh, within yeah. The all, average, all, all of that. So, if I'm talking childhood epilepsy, CBD, fantastic. Like you know, increasingly good evidence, life changing for. So for for the un- uninitiated, there's uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, yep, which, which gets is, you stoned, which gets you stoned, and then there's uh, the cannabidiols yep. with CBD, which do not get you stoned, but do have other psychoactive effects. They think yeah, that that's the one that anxiolytic, calming, and, and clearly. Anti-epilepsy as well, kind of reduces seizures. So if you were allowed to prescribe either, because they're right now they're they're making strains to have higher CBD and lower THC, so they won't get you high, but they'll target specific areas. If you were able to prescribe, you would prescribe something high in CBD for epilepsy. Absolutely, with with THC wouldn't be useful. I think probably for most conditions, it's going to be a little bit of a balance because what you also want is that you might have a condition where THC is really useful, but unless it's balanced by CBD, the stone you get or the side effects you get are unpleasant. But conditions where I think there's reasonably good evidence um, are things like nausea, promoting appetite in people on chemotherapy or with Mm. HIV, you know, you need to put on weight. Uh, spasticity, so people with MS, um, other symptoms of MS really, as people, well. There's the research is in on MS. Yeah, I think so. You're you're convinced. The, the, the spasticity, pain. Um, I mean, certainly you, there's been work looking at people who use opiates for pain, and if you add cannabis on top of that, people are able to reduce their opiate input. Now, what I, what I've heard is that um, opium use is good in the short term, but then the effects wear off, and you need to up the dose and this kind of thing. Whereas with cannabis, it the, you can go for longer as far as pain reduction? I think you, you probably develop less tolerance to cannabis's therapeutic effects. And of course, I think dependence is less of an issue. I mean, there's lots of people who are on long-term opiate therapy for legitimate pain conditions who actually don't escalate their dose. Um, the, the whole issue of, of, of opiates and pain is, is a particularly American issue we're really here. We go again. We've got crystal meth and we've got oxycodone. Oh, but you've also got marketing. And the three most beautiful slides in the world are showing a slide that goes how much money per do. I don't know if I can say a drug company name. Yeah, do I it. Think it was a, okay. okay. Um, so how much money the drug company who put out oxycontin uh, invested in the first five years of its release, and then on top of that, you map uh, the graph that goes. Uh, the increase in sales, and then on top of that, you have the graph that shows the increase in misuse and overdose, and they are four parallel lines that just... (laughs) All heading toward the sky. Absolutely. Climbing the mountain. And how it's taken to 2013 for the weight of physicians and evidence and journal publications to go, whoa, whoa, we really need to pull back on this for it to slightly turn the tide. And actually the last year or so, the tide has turned. So 2015, New England Journal of Medicine, death rates and misuse rates of prescription opioids, they're starting to drop. Really expensive lesson, but I digress. Um, So you would prescribe for pain? Probably MS pain, chemotherapy. Arthritis? Um, wasting yeah. from chemotherapy, wasting All from All of those age, things anything. I think it has a valid role in, plus probably a whole bunch of other things that we just don't know because no one was investing the research. Ah, that was my next question. Unlimited budget, where would you invest the research? Into marijuana, into into either CBD or THC or... I'd probably be guided by what patient groups out there are telling us that they think is most useful for. And I'd be targeting. So you wouldn't put on Led Zeppelin and like smoke a spliff and stare at the ceiling and go, you know, research into uh, foot pain. Yeah. I wouldn't just be looking at those things that it might be really useful for, but also where we have condition, where we have treatments that actually have got lots of side effects and are actually really unpleasant. So, um, you know, I think neurological conditions, psychiatric conditions would be the place I'd go to first. Um, pain. You know, pain's a real issue. Okay, yeah, so pain got real is huge. That's why people have the pill problems. Absolutely. So I think using cannabis to probably augment other treatments. So cannabis as a pain medication might be something that becomes something that allows us to use less opiates. What that I th- would be good. What I think is, personally, what I think is really amazing is the non, uh, you know, with CBD, things that don't get you high, 
but have a, have a therapeutic effect. I had a friend who was, had really bad, um, had cancer and they had really bad bone pain in their hands and uh, it's stuff called Phoenix Tears and she was desperate to get some because she lives in California and had to visit for a funeral and I had, no, I'd never heard of it, but it's apparently this ointment that you rub on your hands very high in, um, in CBD and she swore by it and I realized this is anecdotal and there's tons of anecdotal stories. But if you could cr- create from this plant things that don't get you high but have a medicinal effect, it, it, it really, I mean, it really puts a, a, it not only does it have the effect, it puts a lie to the whole drug war. It's like, what are we doing? The drug war actually limits the ability to research not just cannabis, but drugs like, you know, magic psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, which could be such useful therapeutic tools. But why would a pharmaceutical company want to invest in MDMA's ability to treat depression and PTSD. Why would a pharmaceutical company want to uh, come up and say, 12 weeks psychotherapy with MDMA, uh, you know what, treat your PTSD and your depression. I'm sorry, where's the need for me to continue putting people on SSRIs for the rest of their lives? Where, where, where's well, where is my profit? Well, that's another huge knock about um, what's, happening with the, what's happening with marijuana being illegal. Ever since Anslinger took it off the table, and William Randolph Hearst, who owned huge tracts of, uh, far, you know, of, of trees and pulping for mills to, for his papers, and he didn't want hemp on the, on, on the menu. And we're still suffering from, from the effect of that. The interesting thing from the drug war perspective is anyone can grow a marijuana plant like a tomato, tomato back in their back garden or on their windowsill. So there's no way to really control it. Oh, absolutely. And And I think one of the easiest ways of getting around the whole drug war is actually, and and to increase people's interest in horticulture and, you know, botanical (laughs) interest, is actually, you know, it's not illegal, and some states have got this, is you can grow a few plants. You know, it's illegal to deal, it's illegal to buy, but it's not illegal to grow cannabis in your house for your own use. That would be fantastic. It's a really clumsy phase, though, because if you grow it in your house and you give it to your friends, then you're distributing and they can throw you in prison. There's there's a gray area, but here's an interesting, I want to read you some interesting stats. Pete, uh, can we we play a cool noise for our little stat thing? You got it. Okay. Do, do, you want, do you want me to wait on that or you, you want to put it in we got to drop that in. Okay, you drop, <laughs> we'll drop that in. Okay, so here comes the cool noise. I know you're going to dig this. There we are. Yesterday I was listening to um, a, a meeting of the City Council of Salem, Oregon. They have re- Oregon has recently decriminalized marijuana, both medicinally and recreationally. And the police chief and they had someone who was running a dispensary and they were really like trying to go, OK, well, we've had it legal medicinally. Uh, what are we going to do recreationally? It was really interesting talk that they were having. Something that I didn't realize was a big issue is because the banks are insured uh, by the feds, by the U.S. government, and it's still illegal under, you know, under uh, federal law. They these dispensaries, they can't bank. They can't get a bank account. So it's all cash. So they have these vaults, one for the marijuana stock and one for cash, because you can't have your cash smelling like marijuana. And uh, so they, they've got these fortified Fort Knox-like compounds. They can't use uh, security with uh, you know, armed security. They can't have dogs. They've, and there's been all these break-ins. And so there's all this kind of weird ripple effect. But these are some, these are some stats brought up by Salem Police Chief um, Jerry Moore. In, and he's looking at Colorado for answers to what's, what, it, what they're going to do in Oregon. In the state of Colorado, there are 227 McDonald's, 405 Starbucks, and, drumroll, 827 dispensaries for recreational and medicinal marijuana. In Denver, there are 177 licensed pharmacies and 198 medical marijuana facilities. Doc, in your opinion, are these uh, medicinal dispensaries practicing medicine? Wow, I'm just wondering, are they located next to the McDonald's? Um, (laughs) The the McDonald's aren't complaining. (sighs) So I I visited compassion clubs and dispensaries in Canada and... Um, San Francisco. Big shout to Canada tonight. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, um, and you know, they're going to be, I think, the first big G7 country to say we're going to decriminalize or regulate um, cannabis. That's really going to throw the whole of America and lots of the other G7 countries. Um, Yeah, so that's that's a good thing. Sitting in a consultation and compassion club, there are two things that really struck me. One is there was an incredible amount of compassion and interest in that person's well-being with an, you know, with an interest in understanding what the symptoms were 
and, you know, a real desire to help. Whether or not that exact symptom profile that some person behind the bar was able to extract really matched to whether or not they got recommended power plant, train wreck, blueberry cushion, whatever. <laughs> Green crack. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I like the fact that at least a medical dispensary should be providing advice on good dosing, safest way to use, risks, side effect, interactions. At least there'll be some attempt at taking... Yeah, but they're a bottom line business. They want to sell Raspberry Kush. They want to sell Green Crack. They want to sell Blueberry Cloud. Yeah. I made all those up except for Green Crack. But I worry that within the recreational um, dispensaries, there's not even the guise of we're here for your health. The bottom line is it's pot and profit. Yeah. And and I I don't think that any of those licensed outlets at the moment, for example, have to give mandatory harm reduction information. They don't have to give them little cards that saying, hey, if you've got a problem with your cannabis use or you think you have, why don't you go to drugsmeets.com? Or if you want to see what the risk of your drug use is, you could go to, and these are all things Global Drug Survey has produced, so I'm sorry, but saferlimits.co. There's no mandatory information provision, so people know. I actually found your, I actually found the Global Drug Survey really interesting in that, uh, there were you, you could take a t- you, you could take a short questionnaire to find out you know what kind of a marijuana user you are and how that affects and it, it it's um what what your life probably looks like if you're smoking this much or that much really interesting part of the survey there's also uh you have something called the perfect stone which, which is which is interesting because most people would be like especially the younger kids they just want to get fucked up they just want to get the strongest hardest what it whatever it is just get me wasted Whereas if you actually ask people secretly, they want something way mellower. They want a balanced bud. You know, they want, you know, people, most people want to be able to function when they're stoned. But you're right. There are some people where being stoned is the be all and end all. It's also, there's a macho thing. It's like a drinking game. Passing out, you know, with a pizza box half eaten and then waking up six hours later going, where'd everyone go? I just don't think it's probably what most people who like getting high want to do. All of this, in my mind, kind of pales compared to the dangers of alcohol and, you know, the the, the violence associated with alcohol, the, um, you know, the if you want to talk about people getting into automobiles, heavy machinery, spousal abuse, this kind of thing, a lot of that is linked to alcohol. But let's get back to the economic. Let's get back to the hardcore bottom line. Uh, the rec- a lot of the recreational uh, clubs and things, they will be looking for making the most possible. And it's not just for medicinal use, which personally I think is the most interesting part of the, this whole uh, decriminalization. Colorado is on pace to take in $125 million in tax revenue. Just on what they sold in August, they sold $125 million worth of, uh, you know, from, from the dispensaries, from all those dispensaries that we, uh, that we mentioned earlier. Surely just based on, on bottom line politics, you can't overlook this issue. No, but it's about what you do with that revenue. Well, Colorado, just for, for, the, for the public information, they're building schools. They said, well, we'll, we'll, make, we'll build schools. And there's, a, some, there's some weird provision where if they make, the Colorado government makes us above a certain threshold. They have to give it back. There's a <laughs> refund. They are giving people money back on their taxes. I mean, it works out to like 50 bucks a person, but it's still like, you know, that's a bag of weed. If over a five year period, Colorado could look back and say, as a result of the change in our law, there is no increase in the number of people who are dependent on cannabis. There's no increase in the number of road traffic accidents. There's no increase in the number of high school kids dropping out. There's no increase in the rate of schizophrenia. And, the, and these have to be defined up front. If there's mm. no increase in any of those a priori adverse health consequences, including a, you know uptake of smoking or using a vape or whatever, and they went, and on the plus side, we've had $2.5 billion, we've built three new schools, life satisfaction is fantastic, and we've had... 450 extra McDonald's outlets open. <laughs> um, then, you but know, only some of those things are going to happen. I mean, already, they, I'm not really convinced on the, the car crash scenario, but they, are, yeah. they, they have gone up yeah. since they've it legalized. Sense. People have, you know, also, if people, it impairs your judgment. So if you've had a couple drinks and then you have a joint, maybe you get, maybe you get in that car. I want to see what's happening at Whistler on the ski slopes because getting stoned at altitude 
That's that true. makes you really stoned. Now, you know, I have no experience of that, though you know, I did live in Denver for a couple of years. No, but people will be a bit more floppy and a bit less, you know, tum- I'd love to see... Yeah, what it's like. It, I got I got news for you though. It probably hasn't really changed much in the last ten years since oh, okay, decriminalization. Man. It is interesting because there is a teen. There has been an uptick in teen uh, dropout uh, dropout rates. Uh, there has been, but the murder rate has gone down. The schools I are just get, can't be bothered to stab you. Piss no, off. go away. Well, there's also there was at first the opponents of uh, decriminalized marijuana. They jumped on the bandwagon of oh look at the new violence. There's shootouts in the streets of Denver. But that was because the, the rug had been pulled out from the black market. Suddenly there was this revenue source and the gangs and the cartels were fighting over, OK, quick, we got to shift everything to cocaine and heroin. And there was a so there was an immediate spike, but that's gone down. Violence has gone down. So did Colorado invest some of that money in diverting unemployed cannabis dealers and growers into legitimate sort of <laughs> careers? It's a bit like when you shut down a car plant, the government says, oh, we'll do some retraining. Did they do some retraining for gang members? Okay, uh, that's a good question, but I'm going to go with no. Okay. <laughs> they, they did not repurpose former, former corner dealers into uh, clerks at uh, dispensaries, although they might be maybe the best qualified. Their CV sure doesn't look... Sure doesn't look that good. And the deals would be short. No, no. Greetings. I'm Ian Wynn, straight-up California baller and host of Latopia After Dark. I'm here to match wits and sometimes lose and talk story with some of the finest minds that pass through London, one of the greatest English-speaking cities on Earth. Yes, suck it, New York. Our guests are authors, activists, scientists, journalists, technology wizards, and the occasional nut job, and all come from a place of experience and not from one of blind belief. Please join us for one of the web's most entertaining and thought-provoking shows, Latopia After Dark. I'd like to just kind of clarify for my friends back home what's going on in the UK. The UK seems completely oblivious and even a little embarrassed by this whole, um, by, by what's happening. I mean, like you said, Canada, it's, it's decriminalized. And like you said, that's a G7 nation. Colorado, uh, I mean, California, it's legal medicinally. And, ne- and next it's year, like, they'll have a referendum in November yeah, around the election I mean, time and it'll, it'll clear. It's, it's, California is the world's sixth largest economy. So you're looking at huge numbers. And yet over here, I had, a, I had a close friend who's done me a lot of favors in the past uh, uh, from a country in Africa come over here and was like, hey, can you, can, you score me, can you score me some weed? Now, in order to have this conversation that we're having now and appear somewhat credible, I have not had any illegal, uh, any illegal substance in the last dozen years. So there you go. I'm not speaking from a, from a stoner perspective. Um, but he said, hey, can you pick me up? Can you pick me up a bag? Now, I haven't bought, obviously, in, you know, 12, 13, 14 years. So I didn't know what to do. So I asked around and sure. Next thing you know, I'm like down in a park. I'm on some council estate waiting for some guy named Pyro to make a hand to hand deal with me. OK, and he's some sketchy youth in a puffer jacket. I'm standing. The only reason I was saved is I had my buddy there and we had the dog. So we looked like we were a gay couple out walking the dog, just taking it out in the park. Come on, have a shit there, Olive. No. Then he comes down. I feel dirty. I feel like I've committed a crime. I'm looking over my shoulder, the CCTV cameras. I mean, I tell tell this story to my friends back in in California where you can get vapor, you can get a vape pen and take two. I had a friend who who went to see Hillary Clinton speak while he was smoking a marijuana vapor pen that smelled like strawberries. Okay, I tell- Was that a requirement to hear Hillary speak? uh, I think it definitely probably helped. Uh, it helps suppress the you have rage. You have a lot more than that here, Donald Trump speak. Oh no, Donald, no, Donald Trump. You got to eat a whole brownie. You got to go for the ed- you got to go for the edibles. Uh, I tell people this in California, and they're like, "I thought you guys had thought you were a first world country. I thought you, uh, you guys had socialized medicine, but you got to do a hand to hand deal in the park." What's happening in, in the UK? The government said they're not interested in looking at this issue. Full stop. Full stop. They're not interested, yep. nope. even despite the money, even despite that you and others. I'm, I'm sure would prescribe it for certain pain or certainly want to look at the research. No, I mean, e- even though very senior people who run our government may have self-declared and, you know, uh, reported recreational drug use in their youths. But of course, what, what's, what's, what's a dalliance for our leaders is a, a, a crime and deviance if you happen to be black and on a council estate, throw them in a cage. 
Pete, are you embarrassed by this whole conversation? No, not really. Come on, I, you're a little I, embarrassed. No, no, I want to ask a couple of questions about him. First of all, I want to know what you think about skunk, because in my terms, that's completely new, and it's and its friends. I mean, what impact is that having? So, 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 so what skunk, is skunk? So, skunk in the UK is a term for high potency cannabis. Skunk in the US, I understand, is a term actually for rubbish weed. So, we had a lot of Americans oh. complain in the Global Drug Survey when I said skunk, and they went, "No, no, man, that that's not a good bud. That's that's rubbish." So, it's high potency weed, mostly THC, very little CBD. Yeah. THC. There we are. That's twelve to eighteen percent. That's that's the key right there. Is yeah, how is high it more is it in dangerous? THC? Is, is it, it, what effect does it have it, on, on the young mind? So, um, we published some work from the Global Drug Survey at the beginning of the year, not among dependent users, but the average person who smoked dope says skunk gave them the best high, was the best value for money, but gave them the highest rates of paranoia, memory loss, and dependence. So the real bitch here is that the drug that dominates the market, that makes the dealers the most money and is the most available, is actually, and, and the one that gives you the best buzz is also the one that's actually got all the worst unpleasant bits. The unpleasant bits could be taken away if they added a bit of CBD. I mean, but that's, I, I don't know if that's, it, it's kind of a specious argument because you can say, you know, I really like my first couple, jo I, I really like my first couple drinks. After I have one drink with my meal, I feel great. You know, if I have a cocktail beforehand, I feel even better. I have a glass of wine with, and then I start to, but the, you know, if I have the spirits, I start to wig out and then I can't remember. It gets shouty, fighty, pass out. So it's an interesting question about whether different sorts of alcohol affect you differently. It's one of the questions we were asking in this year's global drug survey. I can't drink red wine. I go, I get headache. I can't drink champagne. But man, you put a vodka bottle down on the table, let's party. We don't know if there's science. We don't know if it's just set and setting. It's like, you know, do people drink gin and tonic when they're a bit more miserable and that's why they end up crying? Do people, <laughs> you know, do, pe do people kind of drink, you know? Ask him at a hen do. Well, that's it. So, no, no, I think it's a fundamentally different, it's a different stone. Yeah, it's, it's a different stone. It's less nice. But it's what I think a younger generation of smokers are sold as best. It's, I mean, potency ain't necessarily what people prefer. I guess that's what I'm interesting. Cannab cannabis high is a subtle... There are so many different, there are so many different ways to go where when I was growing up, it was very much like you just bought a bag of weed, whatever it was. There were two kinds. There was stuff that was green and didn't have seeds. And then there were Mexican rag bags that came up in a brick and had seeds all in. And that was the, those were your choices. You don't know THC, CBD, whatever. You put it in a bong and smoke it. We're Californians, we're bong smoke people. Um, now I have a friend who never smoked dope, never was said, Oh, it made me weird and paranoid and this kind of thing. But Oh no, she wants a number four blue sativa and it gives her the perfect high. That's all she'll smoke. She says, it's great. I'd so much rather smoke that where again, people are not, they just see, it seems weird to me that people are not interested in either the economics, the medicinal effects or, uh, or the social effect. It's just so strange, but it's money. You know, I mean, so I love the fact there's cannabis cups each year, you know, in the Netherlands, in the States where, you know, the five best brands will be put up and you have people who, cannabis connoisseurs who say, I can tell the difference. Now, I don't know if they can, but I know that if you blind, if you put posh wine tasters yeah. and you blind them, you know, five bottles of five pound bottles of wine and $50 bottles of wine, actually, can they really tell the difference? Not after three glasses. Hello. I'm Eric Beck Rubin, hardcore out of control book enthusiast, inviting you to listen to a new show here on Latopia called Burning Books. Every three weeks, we put out a new podcast on a single book. It could be a recent debut, a classic, fiction, nonfiction, and everything in between. The idea is to explore what lies at the heart of great books, books that try to be great but don't quite make it, as well as now and then books that are irredeemably bad. So check out our archive shows on Latopia, and we'll look forward to having you join us for our next podcast. Burning Books, exclusively from Latopia.com. We've done the good. Let's go to the bad. What are the dangers of marijuana? Okay, Legitimate so, dangers. So the biggest risk around using marijuana would be using it young. So there's pretty good evidence that using cannabis before the age of 16 can lead to lasting deficits in cognition. 
Now, so by that I mean can affect your memory thinking, problem solving. Some studies, and this was a big study that came out of New Zealand, suggested it could lead to a 6% drop in your IQ. Now, does that matter? If you've got an IQ of 140 and your IQ drops to 132... I got six to spare. You know, actually, it probably ain't much difference. You've got an IQ of 96... And You're going to need those 90. six points. Absolutely. So, and, and of course, it, early cannabis use generally goes along with a whole bunch of other disadvantage. You know, dropping out of school, maybe an unsafe home environment, other psychological problems. So early cannabis use ain't great. And it's early cannabis use that's associated with that 1.6 to 2 times fold increase in the risk of schizophrenia. So for the young, it's just not a good idea. But then at the same time... Before you expand your brain, grow it. Right. This is a this is a good this is a good point. Okay, I'm taking the vaporizer out of the crib. There's warnings on packs of tobacco. You know, they they don't sell to under 18. Is it 18 here? Yeah, yeah. Winky, 18. Uh, you you can't drink under 18. Surely, the, if it were regulated, they'd slap labels on it. It wouldn't eliminate the problem. But then there are plenty of 14 year olds drinking daddy's liquor cabinet. There would be an argument that a regulated market could a determine what's available. So you wouldn't have 25 percent THC weeds with no CBD balance. Um, You would have a regulated market. People could choose what they want. There would be some sort of control. You could ensure there was provision of health advice. You would tax it. There's a whole bunch of possible benefits that will work well in some countries where your population is basically sensible. A regulated <laughs> market in a country where your population ain't sensible. Are you, we're talking about the southern United States as well. So the sensible population part. Uh, you've got the clever people on the outside in your country. and then in the middle, I have a friend less. who told my wife when she first visited, like, as long as you can see the ocean, you're cool. Chicago, love you. So, so young people, um, vulnerable people with mental health problems, pre-existing mental health problems, generally cannabis ain't good for you. I know there will be people listening to this, maybe, who've got a history of bipolar, who will say, no, actually, the right strain at the right time, I find useful to modulate my mood. Fine. Okay? So there will be individuals where that's fine. And I also know I've got patients with schizophrenia who will say sometimes, if they're anxious or whatever, a small joint can actually help reduce help. that anxiety without worsening that psychotic symptoms. I can't deny the reality that a lived so experience tells it, me. Does marijuana cure cancer? There is a, I think there is a reality that if you're dying of cancer and someone's has, this may lengthen your life. Um you will use something. And I'm sure there are legitimate, and there is, you know, there's some you know, basic science going on at the moment says it might have some anti-tumor activity. I also worry about the possibility of snake oil salesmen taking advantage of those people who are so desperate. Adam, I want to ask you in our final minutes, what is it going to take, do you think, for us to develop a coherent attitude towards drugs use that balances fun enjoyment against the harm it might cause what's it going to take accepting that you know evidence-based drug policy wouldn't be the end of the world um but you know evidence resistance as i've already said is is really difficult to get rid of um probably when political parties go we can do this and it's not going to be a vote loser i think if you had a really narrow race and a political party thought, you know what, we need the edge. Let's fling this in. That would be a really good thing. Because there's a whole bunch of people out there who like taking drugs, who are pretty disenfranchised and don't bother voting. And people are stoned. Often you could say don't bother getting off the sofa because they're eating a pack of chips playing PlayStation. But a way of motivating those people to get off their ass could be to get them involved in a rational drug debate. So the Lib Dems in the UK actually are quite happy to embrace that. Sadly, they got decimated at the last um, uh, election because of the university funding debacle. Uh, Labour, Jeremy Corbyn, for a long time, has spoken about that he's supportive of um, decriminalisation. Unfortunately, the Tories feel quite immune at the moment to listening to anyone's evidence, even their own government advisory body Why on these is this? issues. I mean, are they pandering to a special interest group? Or what's the heart of that? Um, ideology driven by the belief that drugs are illegal for a reason, legal highs will ruin our children, and simply being blind to the fact 
that drinking in cheap bars in Westminster causes inappropriate behaviour <laughs> and assaults, and True. that there, I, I think there are ideologies, and it's about someone in power simply saying, this wouldn't be the end of the world, guys. But then you're looking at the way, uh, I hate to bring Tony Blair into any discussion, Yeah. but you, you look at like politicians following the bad example of the United States and who supports the, who is funding a lot of the, uh, the opponents of decriminalization action. It's the, it's the private prisons. It's the pharmaceutical companies. It's the police unions. It's law enforcement in general. It's the alcohol lobby. Although in Colorado, the alcohol lobby backed off because once they legalized weed, alcohol sales actually spiked. So they took their money away. So there's, you can, you can look at the U.S. and go, well, there's special interest groups telling, you know, informing policy. But then is there a knock-on effect where the, where the U.K. looks over and goes, well, we're not going to do it until, until the U.S. does it. Canada does it. That's not going to be enough. They got the queen on the money. The, the UK quite rightly looks at itself as being a bit special. And, and we are. Um, and, and, and the UK's problem is, I think, we don't do moderation very well. And so really good drug policy works where drug policy reflects the culture of its population. So the Dutch have got sensible rational drug policy because actually most Dutch people are just fairly sensible libertarians and have been that way for hundreds of years. The Swiss as well. Actually, British people, maybe before drug laws, and I do think drug laws need to change here, you can't, you can't ruin a 17-year-old's life because they get busted on the street smoking a can, a joint and they get a criminal record, they can't travel the States, they can't be a lawyer or a doctor. That's just farcical. Drug laws have to protect and not penalise people. In the United States, four times as many blacks are arrested for smoking for, for smoking marijuana than, than whites. Absolutely. And, and you look at Anslinger at the beginning, that racist policy has its, has its repercussions. Oh, and that's still there with your crack and cocaine laws. So when oh, Obama yeah. came in, the penalties for exactly the same weight of crack cocaine versus powder cocaine was 100 to 1. Why? Because actually most people who got caught with crack were black, and most people who got caught with wider white powder cocaine were white. Obama said he would reverse that. What he's done is drop that ratio to 1 to 18. So you're right, drug laws are so often racist. All right, so what I'd like to do uh, before we end is I'd like to uh, inflame the population against the new threat. Can we have a thunder noise here with like a little lightning flash? So we had the opium poppy, right, which then was distilled and weaponized into heroin, okay, which they then like even cranked even harder in the laboratory and turned it into oxycodone and these really high power pharmaceuticals. Apparently, if you're a heroin addict, you'd rather take oxycodone because you don't have to deal with needles and all that except heroin's now cheaper in the state so they're all flooding back to heroin oh is that it's a money okay then we had cocaine you could chew a coca leaf and walk up with the goats in 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 the andes it really helps you get to machu picchu just like a cup of coffee well they put all kinds of uh, what is it kerosene and 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 uh sulfuric acid and they ran it all through there they made cocaine the next menace is actually butane hash oil they take, they, they take the marijuana, the green bud, they run butane through it. They create a substance that they call, that's called wax. They heat it up and it is, looks like earwax. And uh, it's uh, way more powerful than any marijuana strain that's grown. It's practically, as I understand, it's what, 25% THC? Some, oh no, 70, 80. 70, 80%. So a good skunk is, is what, what 15, were we talking about? 15, 20. 15, 20. 80%. They call it wax or dabs or shatter. And it seems to me the purpose of it is an end unto itself, to be that guy on the couch with a pizza on his face. The drive for it was exactly the same initial drive for the distillation of heroin from opium, which was to improve its medical therapeutic use. So the same drive initially for the development of butane, hash oil, and other concentrates was to allow people who are using cannabis for medicinal reasons not to have to smoke a whole bunch of unwanted bud. You can take a breath strip. So it's, yeah, so its origin was actually to support medicine. But generally, you're right, when you mess with Mother Nature and you distill a more purified form of drug, you end up with more problems. So in answer to Pete's question, as it gets stronger, we're going to see more more addiction issues. No, no I, I'm not sure if that's the case. You, I, 
So butane hash oil could be one of the best things that happens to cannabis because it allows particularly people outside the States to suddenly realize they can get high without using tobacco because you can use vaporizers, reduce lung health harms. That's a really good thing. On the flip side, of course, you've maybe got people who have never smoked cannabis before going, hey, I can dab on a vaporizer. That might be a bad thing. And of course, you have got the risk of some people going, ooh, this gets me way more stoned. I'm going to build up to tolerance and get a bigger habit. It's probably not going to be down to the molecule. It's going to be down to the individual, the education, the support. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Adam. I have one, one last question for you. If I make you seeing what's going on in the States and after this discussion, uh, I hereby deputize you as the drug czar of the UK. Uh, please lay down your policy for, uh, for going forward with regards to drugs. Okay, so the first thing is that everyone, regardless of their position in the world, could be very honest about, A, their own drug use experience, but also could be very honest about the fact drugs can be a great source of pleasure and they can ruin your lives. So um, I would mandate an honest date, debate uh, that allowed us to talk about the nice things and the bad things. The second thing I would do is I'd look at all the evidence and go, is our current drug law getting the best benefit from the majority of the population? Uh, the third thing I would say is, is locking up people with a drug problem ever going to do them any good? Uh, the fourth thing I would do is that we're fairly obsessed with something called the recovery agenda at the moment, getting people off methadone and buprenorphine and their lives will be better. Uh, I get rid of all the ignorant government advisors and I okay, now, now, you're, now you're just now you're just pie in the sky here yeah, I, 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 I get the ignorance out of, out of get the ignorance out of government uh, okay I, I get evidence to inform policy not ideology fantastic I like that okay well we've been talking to Dr. Adam Winstock MBBS BSC MSC MRC yeah, okay, <laughs> okay right well thank you everyone for listening uh, I personally would like to encourage you to do three things uh, well maybe four Ask yourself, with alcohol and tobacco being available on every street corner, given what you've heard from Dr. Winstock tonight, would you decriminalize marijuana in your town? Please join our discussion on Latopia After Dark, our Facebook page, or join the Writer's Colony at latopia.com, where I'm sure there's going to be a lively debate after the show, and most, most people will be sober. Um, support Dr. Winstock by taking part in his global drug survey. Where can we do that, sir? Uh, globaldrugsurvey.com. We want to get that over a hundred thousand this year. I think is that a oh, reasonable goal? We'd like goal? to double that. Yeah, double it. Let's get it into the. Let's get it. In, let's get into the millions. Come on, people. And that about wraps things up. Uh, we hope you've been listening uh, sober or inebriated. We're really not all that bothered. I'd like you to ask yourself, would you decriminalize marijuana in your town? Uh, please join the discussion on the Latopia After Dark Facebook page or check out our writer col writer's colony at latopia.com. I'm sure there's going to be a lively debate going on. Um, and support Dr. Winstock by taking part in his global drug survey. The more data, mo better. Uh, just Google Global Drug Survey, and uh, his survey launches November 9th and goes until the end of the year. So please, don't get so high you forget to do that. It would really be a solid for him. Uh, meanwhile, if you like us and what we're doing, and you know you do, ladies, you know you do, please support us by giving us a buck a show or more. Uh, as much as you like, we won't stop you. Just go to latopia.com and all the information is there. I'm Ian Wynn, the techno-pagan octopus messiah, wishing you all a lovely night. Now, uh, seriously, what's the story on those brownies? Mm -hmm.